I'm very glad to be able to announce our next speaker. And I'd like to share a personal reflection right now. At the beginning of the conference, I introduced myself. For many years, I've been involved in think tank activity along with cooperatives. Uh, we direct the Ferdinand LaSalle Center for Social Thought. In Poland, this is quite often a frustrating experience. As in Poland, uh, the tradition of using uh, the work of think tanks by politicians is, is not really deeply rooted. I think this is the common experience of many people in Poland involved in the think tank activity that we feel a scarcity of, have, of the influence on real politics, but uh, working as part of the think tank also has its very good sides, and this is a moment like this. We can invite an author of a book which inspired us all. Uh, we do not only get to meet this person, but also have a meeting, uh, a discussion, debate with this uh, person. And this is a, one of the very good points of uh, think tank activity in Poland. And one of such people who inspired us is Paul Mason, a British publicist, broadcaster in the past, uh, uh, related to Channel 4 and the BBC, where he tackled economic issues. He's also the author of uh, theatrical plays and the author of many important books which perfectly play into today's discussion regarding capitalism and the future of our economy and society. Uh, some of you probably know uh, one of his books, uh, which was published a couple of years ago in Poland. But the, the book, uh, his book that is discussed currently is Post-Capitalism. Uh, unfortunately, it hasn't yet been published in Poland. But perhaps uh, Paul Mason's visit today in Warsaw will be an impulse to uh, work towards publishing a Polish version of this book. I think this is important because within Polish public debate and political debate, uh, we rarely move outside of this direct, uh, the direct events. We often talk about what's happening here and now, but. Uh, we're not, we don't have this tendency to look further to show that the moment related to the global economic crisis and the global democratic crisis is perhaps a turning point. That a certain event, a certain time, period in history, in our history, is already, has already ended and another is yet to begin. I think this is very interesting and Paul Mason has a lot to say about this and I'm very glad that he will share his reflections uh, now. Well, thank you for that, and I, I just hope that we don't uh, allow the Corbyn uh, debate uh, to frame what I'm about to say, because I want to pose it a little bit bigger. To say one thing, though, about me, I'm a journalist, I'm a, an activist inside the British Labour Party, um, I am trying to be a thinker about big political issues, but I speak for myself even though I am seen in Britain as quite close to Corbyn, I am not his advisor, I don't work for him, and I, he doesn't take any responsibility for what I say or necessarily agree with any of it. Um, so I want to start with some... We're going to talk about democracy, about what we're talking about here. I want to start with some advice from George Orwell. In 1940, during the crisis around the evacuation of the British army from Dunkirk, as the British elite made one mistake, one blunder after another, Orwell wrote in his diary that for about 10 years, people like me, left-wing intellectuals, have been able to predict events better than anybody in the cabinet. Orwell said, it's not about any power to see the future, but having the ability to grasp what kind of a world are we living in. Now, in a period where right-wing populism is on the rise and the legitimacy of the multilateral institutions called into question, knowing what kind of crises can happen, what's their likely form going to be, what's going to trigger events that you don't expect, is a really important political instinct. Orwell understood this, and I think it applies to now. The problem I think we face today with liberalism, with the technocracy, with the political center and large parts of the progressive left is that his, it doesn't possess the instinct. It doesn't understand what kind of world we are living in. 
In fact, there is still a tendency to ask in the political centre what's gone wrong with the world and the economy and people's attitudes? Why do they no longer behave as we expect them to? You can see, if you pose it like that, the limited usefulness of, of, of that kind of analysis. It's like in Britain we have, uh, I don't know if, the, if this translates, King Canute, uh, who ordered the sea to stay, or ordered the sea, not, the tide should not come in, and it washed over his head. It, that, that can, you can end up like that. I don't use the term liberal elite. In Britain, it is a term of abuse for globalism. But I do think there is a neoliberal elite in the sense that there is a global social and financial 0.1% associated with tax avoidance, with deregulation, with extreme levels of wealth that has lost its power to understand the kind of world we are living in. Just like the British aristocracy of the late 1930s, who expected if you keep on giving Hitler more and more concessions, war will go away. That was what Orwell meant when he said in his diary, they've lost the power to understand the kind of world we're living in. So I think the, when I speak to students, they often expect me to say, go to the barricade tomorrow, or uh, join labor and get active. I say to them, no, help us with your minds, help us study the kind of world we are living in. Do political theory. You know, so what's happening right now is that the political center, the neoliberal elites thought collective, is seeing the world as a series of disjointed and incomprehensible shocks. So Scotland almost votes to leave the UK. Greece defies the European Central Bank. Britain votes for Brexit. America votes for Trump. In Hungary, Viktor Orban stages his grotesque anti-Semitic campaign against George Soros. And then, in Britain, just as the Brexit process hits the rocks and the pro-Brexit camp are in crisis, you get a newspaper, the Daily Telegraph, repeats the anti-Semitic subtext of the anti-Soros anti campaign, quoting word for word Orban's attacks on Soros. Soros. And then in Germany, the right wing of the, of the, of the CSU... Uh, the, which is part of Merkel's uh, old coalition, calls for a bourgeois revolution to roll back all the gains of social liberalism since 1968. And here in Poland, you have a government that I think is strategically in trouble. No matter how happy they are with their 47% poll rating, P, uh, the, the Law and Justice Party has, a, has achieved something really dramatic and miraculous by getting the, the European Union to trigger Article 7. It doesn't do that. It, you know, there's almost no conditions under which I think it would have done that had it not been forced to the very edge of um, limited options. This is like a child playing with matches for Kaczynski and the Law and Justice, Justice Party. Why? Because... As you are no doubt well aware, you, the free liberal end of Europe is the western end. And the eastern border of Europe borders to a state which is run by organized crime, blemished by the murder of journalists and opposition politicians, and it's right on your doorstep. The illusion, so it's not just the liberal elite, the neoliberal elite, I think the law and justice elite also don't understand the world we're living, living in. Because if they did, they would understand there is no third way between these two projects of a mafia-run Russian state and a, a Europe that works for social justice, peace, and democracy. You know, the, the movie Grand Budapest Hotel was supposed to be a satire, not an instruction manual. <laughs> but they don't get it. So, following Orwell, we need to be trying to be blunt about the kind of world we're living in. How do these disjointed crises fit together? First, what I said in the book Post-Capitalism is that the economic model that ran the world for 30 years is broken. Neoliberalism is broken. Getting Corbyn to go and say that to the meeting of the European Social Democrats in Brussels in October was an achievement. I wrote that in my book in 2015. Corbyn says it in late 2017. It's still an achievement. It's something that many centrist parties are not prepared to say. The whole global model is broken. We need, as Keynes, 
as the liberal William Beveridge who in Britain designed our welfare state, or in America as the Roosevelt administration did, Harry Dexter White designed the, the new order of the world after uh, Bretton Woods. We need to say the old system is broken, we need a new deal for everybody. Um, when I say neoliberalism is broken, I mean the whole world system. I don't just mean America or Britain. I think you know Poland and Germany play their part in this system as well as America and Britain do. And what's gone wrong is fairly clear, that for a while it worked. The same factors that made it work for a while stopped making it work. So it relied on the suppression of wages and high borrowing uh, to drive growth. And in the end, low wages plus the continual offshoring of productive industries and the continued uh, raising of both private and public debts just were inc incompatible. You get a boom-bust cycle getting faster and faster, deeper and deeper. Only central banks printing money and reducing interest rates at, to, to at or below zero stopped us going into a 1930s slump, type slump, and it doesn't work. It just has to, it's like a system on life support. Now, the important question is for us, I think this is fairly well understood. Even the central bankers will say, we can only keep it going for so long. You, the civil society and politicians, have to come up with a new model. But the most important question is, why did the collapse of neoliberalism lead to this right-wing populist wave fueling xenophobia, racism, anti-Semitism, and numerous other prejudices? My, so this is a preview of my next book. Uh, my answer is that neoliberalism was held together by a story. You can keep an economy on life support, but you can't keep a story on life support. Human brains demand coherence, and there isn't any coherence. So what was the story? It said, if you ruthlessly compete with each other and stab each other in the back, forget your communities, your traditions, your existing old institutions, allow them all to be destroyed, and think of yourself only as this Homo economicus, the economic person, the economic agent, not as a three-dimensional human being with a religion and an ethnicity and a sexuality and a place. If you do this, if you become Homo economicus, you will get, things will get better for you. And they did. So people did. They ingrained the thought patterns and the behaviours of neoliberalism into their lives. And then after 2008, they carried on doing this but it got worse, and it got strategically worse. While it worked, it encouraged something inside both business and politics, and indeed everyday life, that I call performative neoliberalism. Everybody performs as in a play. And it goes like this. As long as your department at work meets its criteria for hiring enough black people, enough women enough lesbians and gays, neoliberalism doesn't care what is in your head because you have performed according to a set of criteria. You can actually believe, as we now discover, large numbers of people do, do that all these people you are promoting are subhuman and should not be promoted. It's just that you are obliged by the system to do the promoting. We now know that large numbers of men in America believe that for a woman to be sexually liberated, to have the same kind of behavior that they wish to have, oppresses them. And that this is their number one issue in life. That is why Jordan Peterson, the uh, Canadian uh, psych, 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 social psychiatrist, is now the number one bestseller on Amazon. Because he is giving advice to these men to do what? That biological power is important that your power over the alpha male's power over the beta male and the beta male's power over the woman is natural and lawful. And that's why this guy is selling millions and millions of copies of a book. But as long as we had neoliberalism, we didn't know this because everybody just keeps performing. Now, here's, the, here's my explanation. Once the economic system no longer delivers results, once it is quite clearly being held together by sticking plaster, you know, tape, 
um, the performance becomes meaningless. People realize I'm going through a performance that I don't really believe in. Now, let me say, here in Poland, as in France, it doesn't have to be that things get economically worse in terms of wages. As Professor uh, Gudula pointed out in the previous uh, session, they can actually get better as they have here in Poland. But this, the, the question about the story is never about wages. It's about how does my life get better? How do my kids get a better life than me? How does my society hold together with a narrative? Because this narrative that you told us worked is no longer working. Now, I've never been to Warsaw before, but if you go into probably a fast food store, I, should, I think they exist here, go to a fast food outlet and watch how people are supposed to perform. They're supposed to be happy. Um, they're supposed to... Uh, in, there is one called Pret-a-Manger in, in, in Britain. I don't, I, think, I don't know if there's one here. That, that when the manager goes into Pret-a-Manger, if, if he sees the, everybody happy and smiling and touching each other, okay, uh, that tells him the profits are high. It's a performance. But what's the danger it creates? If I compare it to my father's experience at work, he was a, a truck driver. Um, he would not have obeyed this demand to perform as a happy, happy, happy person for other people. At work in the 1960s and 70s, and I think this was probably true for the Gdansk shipyard, for example, it was a democracy. You had the right to be yourself. And if you didn't like it, you had a right to express the fact that you didn't like what was going on. People at Pret-a-Manger have no right to express that. Indeed, their own worker, their own fellow workers are encouraged to vote them out of a job if they're not part of the team, happy team. Now, my dad's generation, many people in this room are the same generation. Uh, even my own generation had this right at work to be who you really are. But the price you pay for it is that you actually have to be a real person. So if you are a racist, you have to say racist things in the workplace. You say, I'm not happy with the... So what happens? Arguments take place. Democracy breaks out. The racists are defeated by the anti-racists. Everyone knows who everyone else is. There is, in other words, civil society is there at work, at school, in all public aspects of life. And what's happened with neoliberalism, especially in its extreme forms, is it purges the most important place in the world in capitalism, the workplace, of all vestiges of honesty, and it reduces it to a performance. The price we pay is the creation of multiple false personalities, whereby the real beliefs of people are never questioned because they're never expressed. And so as long as I meet the criteria for fair hiring, I can believe anything I want about women, black people, etc., now, this was fine as long as it worked, but now it doesn't work and it collapses. What's happening is that all the secretly held prejudices that were never challenged are now expressed. And there's another thing here, which to my translators, I apologize because I cut this out, but it's still in your original. There's another thing. There was another performance going on. In the globalist era, most elite politicians subscribe to globalization but they never stopped them performing the rituals of patriotism. So they would say, like you with St. Pauli, you know, my team, St. Pauli is the best team in the world. Which is true. Yeah, <laughs> except it's never won the Bundesliga. Well, it's not uh, the best team yeah. in football. Yeah, but, but, but the, the British politicians would say, British jobs for British workers, at the same time as inviting three million European migrants to come and work in Britain. They would say, the British army is the best in the world. The British ships are the best in the world. It's, it, the British empire was progressive. All seen, as again, as performative and not serious. In the same way as I say, my team is the best in the world. Do I really believe it? No. So you don't care. You don't regard me as a delusional crazy. You just think it's part of the performance. But what happened, of course, is that this part of the performance now becomes serious. Because now... There is the only thing left to hold the narrative and the, and, and the story together is that, is who am I? What is my identity? Wh from where do I find truth and 
uh, a kind of teleology. What, what's, my, what's the destiny of me, my country, the community? What, when that's not answered by be an economic agent and everything's going to be okay, people look for other ideas. So neoliberalism in Britain pre-destroyed the self-organization of working people, their communities, their cohesion. And th my experience is that once that had happened, it's fine if you're part of the globally oriented salariat, if you're a university lecturer or a teacher, or even a nurse, uh, paid low amounts of money, but still working in a quite humane, uh, regulated, anti-racist, anti-sexist workplace. In, by and large, it's fine. But if you are a truck driver whose experience is that every time you go to work, some almost mafiosi, unofficial person is there to fine you or to... Uh, e this, remember the other thing about, about manual work? Now, in the era of neoliberalism, full of the threat of physical violence, but unacknowledged. If you go on a building site in Britain, which is full of Polish workers, they'll be subject to the implicit threat of physical violence every day of their life, but they will never tell you about it. Because the threat is, do what we say, or you'll be out, and if you complain, then, then, you'll, then don't meet us on a dark night. That's, that's how the, the semi-organised crime syndicates who run the labour hiring on some British work, work sites work, but we never hear about it. And so it was said, uh, again, in, in Professor Gadula's uh, workshop, but it's something that resonated with me. Having rising wages and rising employment can also go alongside extreme feelings of precarity, precariousness. You, I'll get sacked tomorrow. For some people, the threat of violence and also stress. Um, if you look at, there's been a big undercover story in Britain about what it's like to work for an Amazon warehouse. It's continually stressful to the point where people are breaking down in tears, men and women, breaking down in tears because it's stressful. Again, we, we don't see it. So what do you have left if you live that kind of life? Religion, ethnicity, and the remains of a small town identity, which is something we haven't really talked about today, but I think that I would put that those three things, religion, ethnicity, and one's small town identity, are really important to people from where I come from in the north of England, which voted two-thirds two of people in my town, voted for Brexit, and they did so because they thought it was an expression of their ethnicity, their identity, uh, and their small town community, not so much their religion, actually. Uh, since the victory of Trump, Erdogan, Putin, and Orban, I've been trying to study the ideas of, of those who, who try to understand the rise of Nazism. Not because these modern autocrats are fascists. They are not. But because there is a parallel in the way they have used an avalanche of fake news to spread the idea that there is no objective truth. Everybody's obsessed with Hannah Arendt. Quite rightly, she, she wrote a good book, uh, two good books about the rise of fascism um, on totalitarianism and the account of the Eichmann trial. But th there were better and earlier books written, above all, I believe, by Erich Fromm, the German leftist psychoanalyst who wrote much earlier than Arendt what the problem was that led to, to the rise of Nazism. And he identifies two things. The the general tiredness and isolation people feel in a modern industrial society, says Fromm, combined with the failure of the left-wing leaders of German social democracy and communism, of course, to come up with answers. Um, and then, if you then add to that something that Fromm himself observed, Arendt builds on it in the, in the, the Eichmann book, that is the, the rise of the unthinking and unquestioning small-scale bureaucrat and their mentality of obedience, then those things are what led to fascism. Lots of other things led to it, but these are very important for us. Because you only have to look at the, the society we are in to see how like, you know, how, how like then our societies are developing. We have the tiredness, we have the exhaustion of the Amazon worker and, and the person working 12 hours on a construction site. The failure of the left, well, we could just we could list them. We, it's, it's not uncontroversial that left, centre-left parties are failing, 
And of course, the bureaucratic managerial class has expanded several times over under neoliberalism. You look at all the outsourcing, the privatization by the state to the private companies. It just creates people who are used to saying, yes, of course, yes, what do I do next? Um, now, what kind of world does it create? A broken economic system, a broken narrative, a set of performance, performance behaviors that are now seen as false, and a political elite that refuses to acknowledge the problem. Where have we seen that before? The Soviet Union. Because at a certain point in the Soviet Union's late history, in the mid-1980s, it was obvious to people that it was going to end. There's a brilliant book uh, written from the diaries and letters of people inside the Soviet Union about that moment of realization when they understood, I've lived my entire life in this system, and now it's going to collapse. It's called by Alexei Yurchak, a uh, California-based uh, ex-Russian uh, sociologist, everything was forever until it was no more. And the real problem we have, I believe, is that a lot of people have intuited this about neoliberalism. It looked like it was forever, and now it's gone. So what do we do? So the risk is that, that social crisis becomes, uh, economic crisis becomes social crisis, becomes a crisis of geopolitical fragmentation. That's the first problem. That's the world I think we live in. There is every possibility for me, not just that Brexit happens, which is regrettable, but that the European Union breaks up. That's implicit in the invocation for me of Article 7 against Hungary and Poland. I hope you know, Hungary and Poland will both be hit by Article 7. It's implicit in the fact that I would like the European Union, the Commission, the EU 27, etc., to begin proceedings against the Spanish government over its suspension of habeas corpus over the Catalan leaders. Once we start applying principles to this institution, it could easily break up. Um, NATO could break up. The, the, the whole institutional framework of, of neoliberalism, unfortunately, is more fragile than I think people believe. And if that were to happen, this is the other big fear, that the managerial culture that has been for years just ticking the box going, yes, there's enough black people, there's enough women, there's enough lesbians and gays in the workforce, everything's gone fine. The same managers will just start ticking the boxes for deporting people because that's their mentality. As long as they're incentivized to do it, they will do it. This is what Arendt meant when she described Eichmann as incapable of seeing other people as human beings. I'm afraid that's the, that is what we live with and we must be really frightened of it. So what's the answer? I think we need a radical demonstrative break from free market neoliberalism. By, not by radical politicians by, like Corbyn, but by centrist and progressive and liberal politicians. And a clear commitment from the 1%, the elite, to trying to save the rule of law and the multilateral global system and democracy. Because this is something that they don't actually talk about. The, at Davos this year, apparently the big theme was transhumanism. If I were to, could set the agenda of Davos, it could be stay in this room until you work out what defending the rule of law means and what it isn't and what you're going to do to every country that allows the rule of law to be eroded, uh, one of which we're standing in. Uh, you know, that's not me speaking, that's the that European Commission's ruling on, on the rule of law here in Poland. The risk we run isn't fascism, because they needed fascism in the 30s to smash the proletariat, organized leftist, anarchist, communist, syndicalist movements that don't exist anymore. All they really need is, in fact, the default form of the failed system, kleptocratic presidency that overrides the judiciary, limits freedom of speech, and terrorizes the media. And I'm afraid there are signs of that in many countries, not just Russia and Erdogan's Turkey. I think it's important that we realize how, however, the interests of Vladimir Putin co coincide with those of Trump and Murdoch, Rupert Murdoch, the me me media magnate, even if one is not manipulating the other, as is alleged. See, for Murdoch and for Trump, it helps if extreme instability, constant melodrama, and fake news make people tired, as Eric Fromm says, tired of democracy. Then what do they do? They say, please, Mr. Trump, you take control. We're tired of all this 
crisis and democracy and all these marches, these, these uh, torch-lit marches through Charlottesville. You can, you save us. But then what does Putin get out of it? What, what does Putin get out of a drift to kleptocratic, autocratic rule? First, the West loses all moral authority in its face, in its, in its critique of the Kremlin, number one. But equally important, the West becomes a venue so that the finance system of the West becomes open with no moral scruples for Russian kleptocrats to put their money in. It's a completely functional deal between the two sets of elites, and we've got to stop it. So I think the one other thing I wanted to say to you that's becoming more and more obvious to me is that we're facing an international right wing. It's not just populism. It's not just people in small towns getting fed up of the situation. There is an international right wing agitation feeding off each other with a lot of money behind it to drive these ideas. And the billionaire media is being used as an echo chamber for fascism and fake news for the reasons I described. It helps them if confusion reigns and everybody looks to a strong, rich leader. And the second is a really sad thing. In a culture war, prejudice expands exponentially while reason proceeds in a linear direction. So within just a few weeks of beginning his standoff against the FBI, Trump has convinced 73% of Republican voters that the FBI is trying to overthrow American democracy. Think about that. They didn't think about, they didn't believe that six months ago, but by being in power and picking confrontation after confrontation, you can create an exponential rise of irrationality, but we can't create exponential rise of reason. Now, on the British left at the moment, what that is leading us to do is to say, wherever you can avoid a culture war, avoid it, because it's quite difficult to win. It's a misnomer. A culture war is really a war against culture, a war against rationality, and it's quite hard for rationality to win it in the current situation. So, what we need to do is to create radical hope in a progressive solution, not for a distant promise, but for short-term deliverable goals that increase people's wages, increase the quality and availability of public services, revive towns that have been left behind, and, and, and revive the possibility that your kids can have a better future than you. Um, in Britain, what, what that meant was the important... For, I accept some of your criticisms of Corbyn, but what it meant for us was that we were able to say it's no long, we're not playing the game of establishment politics anymore. We've seen a radical break. In a town like mine, 80% Labour, 20% Conservative forever. And then suddenly, 20% from nowhere for UKIP, for uh, radical right-wing xenophobia, Islamophobia. It came mostly from us, from Labour. So what do we do? We have to say, you know, we're not going to be the party of teachers, doctors and lawyers. We're going to be the party that represents you, but we have a different radical solution to this socialism of fools, this racism, this xenophobia that you have been sold. So we're going to fight it. And on the ground, what happens in the pubs and clubs of these working class towns is that in this corner of the pub are left-wing socialist working class people, and in this corner are right-wing xenophobes, and they, they argue. And what they don't argue about is centrist politics, because the premise of the argument is it's gone, it's over, it, we can't defend it. Now, finally, I just want to talk about because I'm uh, coming to the end here, about um, here, about Poland. Um, the, uh, on the question of the new law suppressing discussion of Poland's role in the Holocaust. Well, since this is event, event is funded by the German Foreign Office, let us start by saying, as Sigmar Gabriel did, uh, that Germany is alone responsible for the Holocaust. Let's make it absolutely clear. And on top of that, I think it could be clearer from the right wing of German society, going back two decades, historians allied not to the IFD, but to the CDU, have, have gently tried to push culpability into a smaller and smaller group of people. It's known as the revisionism debate in Germany. And we could say, let's have the debate, let's not close down any historical analysis, but let's understand the dangers of saying, 
it was a few German people. There was a danger there. But let's also acknowledge that history is about complexity, not national characteristics of people. You know, if a major crime is committed, blaming an entire people and exonerating an entire people are just two very bad ways of writing history. In both Germany and Poland, the events of World War II are now being weaponized in politics. And this poses a grave danger. Because why do we want to keep bringing children to see Auschwitz? It's because Auschwitz cannot be called fake news. It is there. It sits there as the evidence of a major and historic crime. Now, in 1945, when the full horror of the Holocaust was revealed, it prompted deep-rooted anxiety among people across the world because they asked themselves, if they did this, could I do it? It wasn't about Germany. It was about humanity. This is the meaning of Primo Levi's books. If this is a man, if a man can do this, if a human can do this, any human can do this. And it prompted, if you remember, some of you may be as old enough to remember this, a big revival of humanism, of universalism, the universal declaration of human rights, not the international. This is what um, Stefan Hessel, who helped draft it, said. We fought tooth and nail to prevent it being called the international declaration. It is the universal and forever declaration of human rights. And when people looked at the Holocaust and asked themselves, are human beings irredeemably evil? They understood that if they wanted to answer no, if there is the possibility of a good society and not an evil society, the conclusion has to be never again. We have to create, create institutions that say never again. The moment the Holocaust loses its power to stimulate deep moral self-examination among all human beings is the moment it becomes just a weaponized political event. And I'm afraid that is what the, the peace government is, is making it. And that is what the AFD will make it. It's what the Front National has already made it. Remember, in France, already revisionism, denialism. France wasn't involved in the Holocaust either. So who was? It's amazing how many people uh, were not involved in it. So my question to you is, it's a hard one. Brexit forced me to, and my generation, to ask ourselves, could our country go right-wing nationalist xenophobic? Could it go like Viktor Orban's Hungary? And the answer is yes. So the question facing Poland is, could Poland end up not as it was under the Nazis, but like it was in the mid-30s, when there were ghetto benches in the universities. If you think no, I ask you to just consider again. Because what's happening, and it's the same with Germany, could Germany, could the political centre in Germany fall apart under sufficient shocks? Not that we see now, but in the future. If you can't imagine it, what, what do you end up doing? You end up taking risks that are too big. Because the final thought is really not a good one. If the social global order breaks down this time, there's no Geneva Convention. Because the Geneva Convention is being floated all over the world by actors uh, in open, people with blue ticks on Twitter breach the Geneva Convention routinely. The militarization of policing, the heavy surveillance of populations is much greater than it was in any country, even fascist Italy probably, uh, in the 1920s and 30s. We do not want to repeat what happened in the mid-20th century because my argument is we've lost the proletariat, we've lost the people who went to form the international brigades, we've lost the people who fought in the Polish resistance, lost the kind of people in the Bund and then the left Zionist movements who fought here in the ghetto. We've lost that culture. And we're not strong enough to defeat it again in the same way. So better not to risk it happening again. And for me, that is what drives me to ask ourselves, what can we do to radicalize the opposition to far-right extremism, xenophobia, nationalism, and anti-Semitism, and to, and to shake up this propensity among centrist politicians to believe it, nothing can ever happen bad, nothing bad can ever happen in my lifetime again. I think it can, and, but it, it's not inevitable. You just have to recognize the threat and mitigate it and take action. And on that, I'll finish.
thank you very much. Would you like to make a comment or ask a question? It's the right time to ask a question or make a comment. Anyone with a question or a comment? My question would be about the uh, word that's not uh, spread around enough, I think, which is inequality. Mm. Uh, how do you think, what, what definition of inequality would you, would you use to, to most precisely explain the situation we're in right now? Because it's, it's not just about mm. economics. Um, it's, not, it's, it's not an equality of outcomes or, or, or chances. It's, it's something more. It's, it's more of a mental state that that people need to find themselves in. You, you spoke about the narrative. What kind of progressive narrative do you think would, would, would come as a cure for, for, for the problems? Okay. I, I, I agree with your okay. diagnosis. A quick answer? Yes. In, t in Thomas Piketty's book, uh, Capital in the 21st Century, he's very clear on what happens if we don't mitigate the threat um, of rising asset inequality that it's not incomes we're bothered about, it's assets, yeah. that, that ordinary people cannot achieve, cannot own assets, but rich people's assets double and triple in value every 10 years. So that, that kind of inequality is going to breed eventually, and there are some theorists of this, um, Yevgeny Morozov, who is an internet theorist, believes that we're going to end up with a digital feudalism, where the mass of people are stuck in low-wage work, with Silicon Valley gets its, its way, we get uh, taxation pays for a universal basic income. People just live, and then the rich get richer and richer. And they can live in an asset, uh, self-reinforcing asset bubble for uh, almost forever. I think people can see that the beginnings of that. Uh, and the other thing about it is, say, for my dad's generation, who experienced big upward rise in, in, in their income and their, and their mobility even, they, to rise through the social strata. What they were certain of is they could never fall. The, the welfare state meant you will never fall through, through the floor. But today, every working class person can see the possibility of falling through the floor. And so it's, it's, it's not just about inequality, it's about insecurity. So I would address the asset inequality and I would address the insecurity. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, Yushkevich. Recently, there is uh, plenty of discussion about uh, uh, the next revolution, I mean, uh, um, artificial intelligence revolution. Mm. Uh, what is your opinion on the impact mm. of this oncoming revolution yeah. uh, for the social and political relations in Europe and in, the, in general in the world? So that's artificial intelligence. Um, my, my, my response to it is, first of all, that the, those who say um, automation can destroy half of all jobs are right. I don't underestimate the, possible, the, the problems. I think that, therefore, the new part of the left's agenda, which we in the, my wing of Labour have been very, uh, very strong on trying to push into into the mind space of the old social democrats around Corbyn is things like universal basic services, universal basic income, low work, high leisure society. That's important. But there's an even more fundamental thing, and that is uh, at Davos, transhumanism is a buzzword for a reason. Because if we are post-human or transhuman, then there's no universalism possible. Because the transhuman with their, their robotic arm is, is, more, is, is a higher being than me, the homo sapiens. Once you can achieve that, a break in 40,000 years of human history, uh, you, you achieve quite a lot as corporations because you can then say, when people say, I want human values, not corporate values, you say, they don't exist. There's no humanity to, ex to defend against artificial intelligence, against algorithmic control. And so for me, it becomes really important to wage a humanistic defense of our rights. 
No, of course that um, opens up a huge um, can of worms, as we say in, in, in England, because because the, the left does not really do moral philosophy. In fact, it's the right who have kind of colonised moral philosophy. And I believe one of the big things we have to do on the left is to rearm ourselves with some kind of humanistic moral philosophy that allows us to, to hold our hand up and say no to certain things to do with artificial intelligence and algorithmic control um, quite quickly. Final point, though. I, I've talked a lot in the writing of this next book to artificial intelligence people. A lot of them, uh, you know, a lot of them, more than you think, understand how, A, it's dangerous what they're doing, and B, it's dangerous socially because however good their controls are, China is continually trying to steal what they're producing. So if you produce a beautiful robot to make everybody happy here, then China steals it and it is used for bad purposes in China. Can you safely produce it in the West? They are already asking that question. They're also asking the question about what kind of social contract the entire AI industry has to do with society. They fear another tobacco uh, industry kit fiasco, that in 20 years' time, all the things they're doing now are used as evidence for a major lawsuit that destroys their industry because they didn't think about them in advance. So, but this, we could probably do an entire other meeting for the... For the, for the Ferdinand LaSalle Institute on that. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Sylvain. I'm from France. Um, just, I think it will not, I don't share your diagnostic at all, mm. uh, in my opinion. Uh, I think it's messy. Um, I think it's not complex enough. You have said in one point that history is complex, talking about uh, the Shoah things, and after I think your diagnostic is about neoliberalism as a big thing, mm. but you don't explain very much in detail what is neoliberalism at all. Mm. Um, I share, I read some summary of your book, I, I share more or less what the solution or sustainable uh, society, more uh, discussion, more, more redistribution. I share your problem about inequalities, but just what is your methodology? What are you, what, why are you saying all that are you saying now? It's just observation. Um, have you made some interview? Just can you explain you a little bit? Okay. Because I, 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 I lost myself between Trump, Orban, mm -hmm. Second World War, and sorry. Okay. Yes. So I know what you mean in, in this sense that um, I find a lot of academics are trapped in um, in a kind of world where speculative thought and uh, the ability to think outside of um, a series of uh, given proposals uh, is prevented by an academic way of thinking. So as a journalist, what I am as a journalist, and in other words, uh, my work is not peer-reviewed in that sense. Um, and, it, and the methodology I work from is, first of all, realism. So I believe the reality exists outside my senses. Materialism, I believe that uh, being determines consciousness, as, as, as materialists do. Um, and I also believe uh, it, that there is a, a process of change that is studyable in society, understandable through class, um, which I call historical materialism, other people call Marxism. I, I don't think Marxism stands up as a, as a whole body of thought, but its materialist understanding of a society like Germany or Poland, is a good starting point. So that's my methodology. But then what do I do? I, yes, there are a series of observations, interviews insofar as interviews are interesting, and the attempts to theorise. And my concern, my biggest theory, if you, since you've asked a theoretical or methodological question, my biggest theoretical concern right now with the West trying to defend itself is the irrationalism built in to a mode of thought called postmodernism, which I call the slave ideology of neoliberalism. It is the irrationalism, lack of rationality, constant skepticism uh, of, of, from Foucault onwards of postmodernism that I think has got this generation into a position where it can't even defend what it means to be human. So I prefer to go back to, yes, Orwell, Levy, uh, Arendt, um, Raya Dunayevskaya, the Hegelian Marxist, Trotsky's secretary. You know, old Marxism of a humanistic and, 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 and 
a humanistic method is to me more interesting than everything written since 1979 by postmodernism. But that's a controversial uh, position. question will be the following. In what you've said, uh, you refer to Homo economicus, but it's not a biological man. We don't have uh, consciousness uh, of our needs, of the need to eat, uh, breathe, drink water. We need a community to live in. There's no ecosystem. There are no common goods. So today we see the escape from the neoliberal crisis through thousands of locations in the world where people recover their right to uh, land through their communities and to meet their needs together to gain the autonomy from the system. And this is not present at all in your reasoning. So actually it's there in, in my book, Post Capitalism, that I do think the, the um, peer-to-peer -peer economics, as it's called, uh, collaborative production, non-managed production, I think is a great starting point for a mo the, the transition we need to make long-term, both to an ecologically survivable form of economy and one that, which, which contains answers to the high inequality. But what, what, um, what defines my contribution to this debate about post-capitalism uh, is that I see the state as important. So I see the state as a, uh, the vital lever in, first of all, incentivizing creation of peer-to-peer -peer commons production, protecting it, uh, legislating to make it uh, expand the area, and then suppressing the, the other kind of production, the constant speculation. Um, and th this leads then, on the left, to, a, to people saying to me, but you believe the capitalist state can be used in this transformative way, and I say yes. So in that sense, I am a social democrat, and I believe that we have to try to use the existing state, whereas many people, as you will know, if you're from that world of either green or sometimes anarchist peer-to-peer -peer work, believe that the, the way to do it is to create an alternative society outside capitalism, and eventually capitalism falls and this survives. I, I don't believe in that perspective. I do want to try and use, to give the state a new social democratic mission that is more than state intervention and planning and more than the market. So I believe that the state must enlarge the non-market, collaborative, non-profit part of the economy. Uh, and of course we haven't talked at all about, about environmental uh, crisis, but I'm convinced that everybody in the room understands the severity of it. I speak English, so don't worry. Um, and <laughs> just, I mean, obviously, your, your, I mean, your speech was great and super. Uh, was great to listen to you, and uh, also I like really many of the ideas you put forward, uh, how we move forward politically. But then at the same time, like your analysis of the future as it might be, seems to be rather dystopic, mm. and. I must sh say that I don't, well, it could go a, mm. a completely different way. The dystopia is one possibility, but not necessary. And, and I must, I don't subscribe to the dystopia. And then your analysis of neoliberalism, of course, neoliberalism is somewhat in crisis since, well, since the beginning of this millennium at yeah. least, and neoliberalism maybe maybe existed uh, in the 90s. So I mean, the 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 point that neoliberalism is in crisis is somehow 18 years old, yeah. and um, and I'm I must say I'm not convinced by your description of how the neoliberal economy works. Okay. Be, that it is only a performance and that it's in all workplaces like that. I must say that it doesn't, doesn't, I think that the, the German society or other societies don't work that way. This is one part, and I'm also actually sure that the British society doesn't work that mm -hmm. way. It is one part of the economy, but it's not the whole economy, and I don't think we really understand, cannot understand neoliberalism in that way. And I think it's problematic 
I, I, I must say, and, and that's maybe my question, I did not understand now your differentiation. Somehow, like, neoliberalism is almost evil, yeah? And then, but we have to save liberalism somehow. Mm. And now, how we do that? Because there is somehow a connection, you know, mm. and I guess there is, would be a role for political, political liberalism and social democracy in my understanding, is also always liberal yes. and is free yes. and wants to empower the freedom of people and of individuals, mm. not mm. only of mm. masses mm. or classes, mm. but of individuals. And that's yeah. what is very important to differentiate it from Marxism. And that's why Marxism and social democracy come maybe from the same source, but they have at least found uh, different answers. And I think that's why I'm a little bit troubled by your, uh, the beginning, because it seems to me it is too much about class and about like these general developments, and then the individual is maybe also somewhat left out. And okay. I don't expect now, no, 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 uh, no. but maybe you can answer it all like quickly. Well, well I, I can't answer it all quickly, but what I will say is that it, in the book that I, that it, I am the most identified with, the two most recent books, one which was about the Arab Spring and the Occupy movement, called Why It Is Kicking Off Everywhere, which is about the protests, and then in post-capitalism. There is a theoretical, and you may be interested in this as well, there is a theoretical attempt to show why not Lenin, but Marx was wrong about the proletariat. That, in fact, the agent of change is humanity, not... Um, not one particular class. And, and therefore, uh, if I overemphasized class, maybe it was because I was thinking about here in Poland right now. But for me, the agent of, of the future of humanity is individuals, absolutely. And this is why when I, say, when I identify as a, Marx, as a Marxist, I think there is a Marx who is humanistic. It is the Marx of Paris in 1844 and the German ideology, of which there will be a new uh, version out this year. But... Okay, so that answer on that. On my analysis of neoliberalism, and look, in, in a short period of time, it's impossible to go through the whole thing. I think the motor, of, the motor of the whole system, so not of one country, but the whole system, was the creation of financial imbalances between producing and, and consuming countries. And that this... So the debate between somebody like me and, say, Martin Wolf of the Financial Times is he thinks that it was not inevitable that the imbalances took place, whereas I think the imbalances are built in. Once the imbalances are, financial imbalances are built into the system, they can only resolve themselves as a series of bigger and bigger financial crises. Now, you say it's been in financial crisis, of course, since 1997. Uh, the whole, that's the first financial crisis. Then, then dot com then there's securitized finance, and we have not had the, the next one. I think each of these is bigger, and what they do is they remove the ability of the system to replicate itself successfully, and it's more and more... So you have a system based on the ideology of private ownership, where banks are implicitly insured by the, the state almost the entire world, and a system built on the idea that the central bank does not intervene into the economy. However... In every economy, the central bank is intervening to keep it alive. So it's the, what is important to me and what I try to stress today is the incoherence of the story. Uh, there is a perfectly uh, good and much more uh, complex analysis of what went wrong with neoliberalism that I would share with uh, mainstream ec economic thinkers. Soros himself has wrote, written a perfectly good book about the super cycle, what, why financial cycles are unsustainable. So... I think I'll leave it there and say, that obviously, there's a lot more to discuss. Um, yes, the answer is, and we found this in British Labour, the answer is not to start talking about class. However, there is a section of British society that still thinks and acts in that way that is very class orientated. What we found in the last election was, was by taking, as it were, modern networked individual people as activists into those communities and showing that they could have an, an argument and an, and an adaptive political persuasion process showed that we were willing to do that in a way that other parties weren't. Uh, the, the parties of the liberal centre, the liberal centre for me, have stood back and said, this is an alien being, this, this white working class, we can't convince them, better to suppress their 
their vote, just try and keep them out of politics. Um, whereas the right wants to pull them towards its, its project. We went to them, and yes, we introduced some young people from a very much more networked and socially liberal uh, background. The final point is, I would say, social democracy or the left, the progressive left, what we all have in common is our defense of social liberalism. The, exactly what Dobrindt in, in Germany has declared war on. You know, to roll back 1968, the Bürgerliche that that the, the Alexander Dobrindt wants, we must resist. And in that, I think that we, the left, whether it's the Greens or the Social Democrats or the far left, if they can bring themselves to do this, can be the force that says to the young of a country like Germany, we will defend 1968 unconditionally. It is unconditionally good that contraception, access to uh, abortion, access uh, the, for gay marriage, etc., is, is part of our society. We'll never give it up. Uh, but I don't call that liberalism. I think what I call, I'd say that it is social liberalism, um, and it, it's seen by young people as an inalienable right. Um, maybe not here in Poland, but in many parts of Western Europe, it is. Bardzo good. Bardzo dziękuję. Thank you very much. Thank you. Myself, for your very interesting.